When I was flying a DC-3, I was once sent on a mercy mission to Cotabato. Sometimes we would fly soldiers there, sometimes relief goods. But we had to do this at night. And we had to turn off all our lights. Why is that? Because they would shoot us down. The, air, the airport would be completely dark. You won't see the runway. Once you're near, they would light bonfires on both ends of the runway. We would use these two fires to light the aircraft up for landing. Hi, are you there? No, no, your, your screen is not broken. It's just hard to see me. What about now? What about now? Is it worse? It's worse, right? We are just trying to show you what pilots see during low visibility operations. Or when the visibility is so bad due to weather such as fog and even low clouds. Surely you can't drive a car in this weather. Face it, no one is a big fan of driving in the fog. But when living in Northern California, it's inevitable. Right now, investigators believe heavy fog may have led to a deadly crash in Redondo Beach. So how the hell do you expect us pilots to land a plane that's flying to the ground at 250 kilometers per hour? We're pilots! Maybe we have some sort of superpower? X-ray vision? Something close to that? Well, us pilots have what we call the instrument landing system. That can help us land you safely, even when we're, well, practically blind. My father was a World War II pilot, but eventually he joined the airlines. He would tell me stories of how they used to navigate and land visually. He had a notebook. This notebook would have notes about what he needed to look for. Maybe a river, a tree, a mountain, anything that he can use to help him navigate and land in all the airports that he flies to. One time, he was flying with an airline captain. The captain got a bit lost and asked him, Hey buddy, do you have a better idea of how we can find this airport? Since my dad had notes of all the airports, he knew, he knew every time where the airport was. So he took over the controls and found the airport. He passed this notebook to the other pilots to help the other guys out. Hello Pilot Talkers, I'm Pilot Franco and welcome to the Pilot Talk Show. The vlog where we talk about everything and anything in aviation. So tell me, is this statement true or false? If you can't see the runway, you can't land. Comment your answers down below. When I say it like this, it sounds so uh, rhetorical. Like It's like common sense. But actually no. If pilots can't land the plane just because we can't see the runway, then the airlines will be in very big trouble because it can get very expensive. Cancelled flights are inefficient and inconvenient. Also, it is unsafe because there have been a lot of air crashes that have been caused by poor visibility. All these things we mention is the main driver for what we call low visibility operations. But to understand this more, we have to rewind the clock by 90 years because its history is quite fascinating. Aviation started back in the 1900s. And back then, pilots would navigate and land using only their sight. Of course, we still do this today, especially when there's good weather. We call this visual flying. And we even have a set of rules governing this, co this called BFR or visual flight rules. But it's not always good weather, especially in Europe where fog and snow is a common occurrence. It sounds fun, maybe even beautiful, but it is not really good for us pilots. You know, back in the 1950s, there was a killer smog where the smog was so thick and polluted that it killed 12,000 people. The dangerous smog turned day into night, grinding ground transportation almost to a halt. This was the type of conditions pilots were flying in back then. This type of weather would mean airlines and pilots would have to cancel flights. No one could see the runway. So this is 
the beginning of instrument flying as we know it. Instrument flying is where pilots use a set of instruments, both on the planes and the ones installed in the airports, to help guide us when we cannot see anything outside. Today, what we call IFR, or instrument flight rules. And these rules govern how pilots should fly during poor weather. So you're familiar with the approach charts that we usually use, right? Take that and remove all the instruments that help you land because they were not present back then. Back in the 1920s, they used to use bonfires to help pilots navigate at night. Bonfires? <laughs> yes, bonfires. But this eventually evolved into lights, of course. By the 1930s, airports started using a series of beacon lights. One to help the pilot find the airport, then a line of lights to help the pilots find the runway. Several other countries were also testing out more accurate landing systems that use radio signals. Some of them use Morse code and another called the Lorentz Beam. They were testing the very early versions of the ILS or the instrument landing system that we know today. This radio navigation aids eventually augmented the lights that I just mentioned. They would have radio signals broadcasted from the runways and marker beacons to show pilots their progress during the approach. By 1938, you had the first landing using the system. I think it was the Boeing 247D that landed in a snowstorm using only the instrument landing system. Over the years, these landing instruments became more and more modern. By the mid-1940s, the U.S. Army started using higher frequency signals to create straighter approaches and also the DME to provide distance data. By 1964, the first fully automated landing happened in Bedford at Bedford Airport in the UK. This is how the aviation industry came about with the ILS or the instrument landing system. And we are still using it to this day. It has allowed us to make sure we don't cancel flight just because we cannot see the runway. Of course, we now have more accurate and reliable transmitters and receivers. We've also established a standard for this type of operations, and we call it low visibility operations. Okay, this sounds so simplistic, right? You have radio signals, the plane captures it. The fact that this technology has become so reliable to the point that the planes can land themselves. Plane can land themselves. It's, it's mind blowing. And it also sounds dangerous to put your life in the hands of these radio signals in these antennas that I have never even seen before. The scary part is the fact that technology can fail. These radios, these antennas, and even that phone you're watching this video on, it can fail. Not only that, you have to remember that behind every aircraft is a pilot. On top of every tower is an air traffic controller, and they're humans, all prone to mistakes and lapses. So how do we now solve this problem? Because lives are literally at stake. Now here comes the beauty of aviation. The fact that we have identified all the several breaking points of a system has allowed us aviators to come up with fail-safes through training and contingencies so that when something does fail, it doesn't end up like this or this or this. We try to avoid these as much as possible. Landing is already one of the most critical phases of the flight. On the other hand, low visibility approaches, <laughs> that's another beast. You remove our eyes or the view from the cockpit. What do we do now? We have to monitor a bunch of screen in front of us. And we also have to react in a split second in case something goes wrong with the aircraft. Yes, auto land, simply said, is letting the autopilot land the plane. But is it really that simple? One big no. So there are a lot of requirements for auto land. Number one, we have to try and minimize the human factor, the mistakes. Because everyone involved in low visibility procedure is trained, not just as pilots, but we also have the traffic controllers, and this is heavily regulated. So in the flight dispatch, we already know if we're going to be doing a low visibility landing. This does not happen very often. But if it does, you have to be ready. So if we have time, we review our procedures at the flight dispatch, then we review it again during cruise. So once we get there, 
we are not really surprised if there's bad weather. You just really have to be ready. Number two, when you listen to the ATIS, you may hear low visibility procedure enforced. This means that the airport has the required equipment to actually allow the planes to do low visibility operations. These are procedures like uh, increasing the distance between traffic and also protecting the sensitive areas of the ILS. But wait, 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 wait. We can't move further until I've made you understand how an ILS works. Again, it stands for Instrument Landing System. It has two radios that guide a landing aircraft. One is the glide slope. It guides the aircraft vertically down to the runway with a slope that is usually 3 degrees. Second is the localizer. Now this one guides the aircraft laterally so that the aircraft lands on the center of the runway. Combining these two, a vertical and a lateral guidance, and you have a landing system that has a clearly defined path. So precise that we can allow the autopilot to follow these signals down to the ground and let the aircraft land itself. Okay, so this radio signal is very critical and our traffic controller protect the signal. Because if an aircraft passes around that radio transmitter sensitive area, then it can throw off the radio signal and throw off all the planes using that specific radio signal. And that can lead to disaster. In the simulator, I would put erratic localizer signals. What would happen is once my students land, the aircraft would veer off the runway. Most pilots would be able to catch this. Some would end up outside the runway. This is part of training. It can happen in real life. Number three, aircraft capability. We have a long list of required equipment for this plane to be able to perform an automatic landing. We have it right now, I'll show you. So when you go down on the aircraft, you will see all the required equipment outside. Of course, they're covered. So at the very front, the nose part or the radome of the aircraft. Do we use that for um, low visibility approaches and then um, further back towards the tail of the aircraft, you will see our radio altimeters 1 and 2. There's two of each for everything. Now the question is, when something breaks, does that mean you are no longer allowed to perform an autoland? No, obviously it depends. If something is broken, then that just means you need a bit more visibility to compensate for that broken equipment. But if the weather is really bad and let's say you broke this one, this one, then sorry, you can't perform an auto land. But remember, airports also have a lot of equipment that can break. For example, the transmissometers. These are equipment located along the side of the runway and it measures the actual visibility of the runway. It allows the pilot to decide whether or not we'll have enough visibility after we land. Once in Tokyo after landing, we exited in a wrong taxiway and we ended up in front of a cargo terminal. We got stuck there for around 35 minutes. <laughs> and also in Chicago, once one pilot said on the radio, I think I'm lost. Then suddenly a bunch of other crazy pilots started teasing him. I think I'm lost too. <laughs> so everything we mentioned allows us to fly you, even when there is bad weather. And it's not limited to landing. It's also for taxiing and taking off. And it's fascinating how humans have evolved from using bonfires to using ground radio signals and letting the airplane land itself. Some airplanes even have a HUD or what you call heads-up display. So it's a transparent display that displays all the flight parameters we monitor during approach. It can even have a runway representation that can make pilots feel like they can see the runway in front of them. We undergo extensive training for this. Get this, every six months. All this for you, pilot talkers. So that's it. We hope you learned something in today's episode. And we hope that this sparked your fascination even more with aviation. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. I'm Pilot Franco, and this is Pilot Talker.